Um, I'm going to ask the so I'm going to ask each group uh, a question to uh, to start the discussion, and I'm going to read the questions now. But then I'm going to start with the theorists. Uh, for the theorists, we're going to uh, ask what do you see as the most pressing material. Uh, sorry, given the theoretical proposals that are currently on the table, what experimental or theoretical work needs to be done to adjudicate between them? Okay, so don't start yet. But to Leslie uh, Scoop, uh, I'm going to ask, what do you see as the most pressing materials issues or what new materials platforms do you think we should focus on developing? So we'll come back to you. And now we're going to go to the theorists. Um, they are um, Baskaran, uh, uh, Pierce Coleman, uh, Nigel Cooper, and uh, Sentiel uh, Tadadri. Uh, so again, the question is, given the theoretical proposals that are currently on the table, uh, I guess this is related to samarium hexaboride or maybe, maybe uh, all of these insulating oscillators. What experimental or theoretical work needs to be done to adjudicate between them? Pretty open-ended question. Um, so someone should um, just step in. But uh, I would like to step in. Can sure. I show a few slides? Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah. Sorry, I just want to make oh, one you point have to, before. You, Oh, you have to I leave. have to leave yeah. it at 11.40 sharp. I mean, I'm fine to talk in between, just that we have that in mind that I'm out of this Zoom at 11.40. Okay, actually, so, okay, so yeah, yeah, I was told about that, I forgot, sorry. Um, it's okay. Maybe we should do Leslie first, okay? Sure, sure. Okay, sure, sure, sure. yeah, no sorry. problem. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry, about that. <laughs> sorry about that. Thanks for coming. Um, no, that's okay. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you for that question, so I think, Honestly, this is like a big material challenge in general, because so far we have two material groups where we saw something in this area, right? Like uh, lanthanide borides. So I'm, I'm grouping samarium and deuterium boride together. And then uh, tungsten diterbide maybe. So this is um, from a crystal growers perspective, not that much variety yet, right? I mean, it's great that a second class of tungsten diterbide came on addition to that. However, when we come so I think in the Borai cruise, we, we saw yesterday that they did a lot of work of trying to um, rule out crystal growth uh, problems, right? Like, um, is aluminum flux killing it or not? And is the floating zone better? Can be uh, purposely put in impurities because we can never get rid of gadolinium impurities to get rid of this. So I think in general, having more systems will help us understanding that because um, if you don't have a rare system, you don't need to worry about gadolinium impurities, obviously, right? And so I think I think um, all of the people in my field should like think about what are the candidates that are the obvious next ones to test. And I mean, I like, I like for example, if was Kim suggested looking at um, titanium disulfide, I think tantalum disulfide might be a good um, 2D materials to look at also because there's some monolayer STM experiments um, of it having some kind of a spin liquid state with fracturalization. So if it's going in this direction, maybe there's something there. Um, a good question that, uh, or a question that I generally have is that so far the two systems we have, both are very, very small band gaps. The question is, so if, if Sanfang is correct, if we were biased against insulators, um, shouldn't we look at much larger band gap materials and then you take opportunities of the ones where we can measure 2D sheets on it because then it's not such a big problem of, of having the big insulating um, gap to bridge and transport. So I think we should we should be less shy <laughs> and just trying to, to put out all the layered materials we know and see, see where we find it. Because I think the more we get, the easier it will be to resolve all this heated discussions we have right now, right? And then um, I think there's a second materials pro problem which is completely unrelated to um, the, in, the quantum oscillation insulator um, question, which is the gate problem. So um, in, in the, when we worked on the revisions for um, Sanfang's paper, and we were asked about the graphene gate question, Sanfang asked me if I know another layered metallic material we could use as a good gate instead of graphite to kind of rule that out. But this is actually a difficult question. So I came up with one, but which is zirconium betaloride, and there's some data in the, manuscript showing this, but the issue with that material is 
that is very air um, sensitive also. And so it's hard to get a good gate and a good quality device with two very air sensitive samples. Therefore, the, the, why we did still see quantum oscillation in this data, which by the way, is also I think an important point um, in, uh, in respect to the graphene question, the quality of the device is just very poor. And so, so I think another materials question we should ask is, do we actually know exfoliatable metals <laughs> that aren't air sensitive that we can use as gates? And then can we repeat all these experiments without graphite and therefore rule out that problem? Um, and so, yeah, finally, I want to point out that sample quality seems to be immensely important to this. I mean, it's always important, no matter what kind of physics we want to study, but in this one, I feel like there's always an explanation you, you can come up with impurities, right? And so um, for that also a multitude of systems help because each system will be different in how you improve the sample quality. In the boride, it was like avoiding the flux and using floating zone. But yeah, as I said, you cannot, you can never get rid of all the impurities of rarers. In tanks and telluride, um, sampling showed how, how the quality of devices changes with a sample quality. So we can make a lot of improvement by just improving that quality. But of course we have its own issues that I think you should study what much, put more de um, studies in what are the defects in tanks and telluride exactly? How can we control them? Like there's a lot of <laughs> previous work on, on the borides about it. And if you, you know much more, whereas in tanks and telluride, we can still learn. But if we actually find a system with um, a larger band gap, then from a crystal grower expect, uh, perspective, it's easier to control defects. When defect chemistry is always um, in small band gap system or metallic systems very prominent, but the more ionic and larger gap is, uh, the fewer problems we have with defects and growth. So I think that like bringing up a material like this would also make a tremendous um, progress on, um, on that aspect. Yeah, so that's what I have to say right now, but I'm happy to ask questions, uh, answer questions regarding regard to all that. Are there any questions? Uh, let's see, I'm supposed to look at the chat for that, I guess, right? Uh, Art, we'll monitor the chat for you if you want. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say uh, just one comment. Um, uh, there is a class of, uh, of, of metals based on the chromium boride structure. Mm -hmm. that are very very lamellar, except they're not uh, exfoliatable, at least not easily. Mm -hmm. So th those, might, those might be, uh, and they involve, you can, you can substitute any of the rare earths in, uh, you know, so rare earth palladium, for instance, is one option. So you mean for the 2D metals? Yeah. Okay, you, yeah. You said you were asking about whether there was a 2D met, uh, an exfoliatable met metal. Yeah. Uh, someone says, uh, what about gadolinium tritelluride? It's even more That's air sensitive, Priscilla. sadly. Than more than even, even more. It's even worse. But also gadolinium trilluride has quantum oscillations by itself and high mobility. So like, zirconium ditelluride we picked because it doesn't show quantum oscillation in the bulk crystal. So that we kind of rule out that we induce it from the, from the proximidized one. Okay, well, um, yeah, so uh, any other questions? Uh... I just want to make a short comment. Yeah. Ms. Lee said that we should look for system with large gap. I think mm -hmm. when you go to large charge gap, for example, it's a strong water insulator or a band insulator, some of the subtle many body effects get suppressed. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to have small or reasonable gap. Okay, so, so the question is how large mod, mod gap, then spin-ons could induce some you know charge dynamics, but then the amount gets lower and lower as the charge gap becomes larger. I just I see. To... Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I think there's um there's um a sweet spot where you probably can find like the maximum gap where this is possible and we can get ideal crystals and where where we can't. So maybe that's also something worth thinking about. That's right, because the gap that you see are like 20 milli electron volt. Uh, right. Very small. So it seems to be, if everything is a subtle many body effect, it's better to focus on smaller gaps. Okay. Anyway, I, actually I find uh, um, the issue of, of approaching these fundamental problems through new materials, uh, it's, it's often quite, um, quite fruitful. 
but one can, um, as, as we've seen, some of the best work comes from diving deeply into a specific material. So one can't dive deeply into many materials. And so there's an operational re operations research uh, yeah. uh, question about this, right? Well, yeah, I sort of agree with this. It's, of course, important to dive deep in, in one material to perfectionize it. But I also think we learn from each additional material where this comes up and it helps us narrow down the search in which material we should actually dive deep in. Because, I mean, we started with the borides because they were the first ones that showed that. But how don't we know? I mean, we don't know if there isn't a better one out there where we can actually get much cleaner data. But the from, boride, right? I mean, samarium, samarium hexaboride was studied back in the 70s for its, for its mixed valence behavior, right? And so it just, was just around. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but that's not, that makes it too easy sometimes, you know. Sometimes the better one is still hidden. I mean, I think okay. both, both things are worth yes. putting effort in. So Kin Mac makes the point that tantalum diselenide is quite air stable. I think you mentioned either the selenide or the sulfide, but that mm -hmm. those are actually, you know. Um, okay. Great. Right. So yeah, but yes. the, they're, they're not metallic. You mean for the gap, for the gate or for I don't the, know, you have to ask him if you just I mean, Yeah, okay, I it, mentioned. It is metallic <laughs> and it's for the gate, yeah. Ah, okay, so maybe yeah. that's something worth trying then. That's a good point. Uh, nice. Okay. That's one of the short point. Okay. There seems to be two families, odd electron, mott insulator, and even electron uh, uh, condo insulators. So, whatever we have seen experimentally seems to be mostly related to even electron system like samarium hexaboride, terbium, and WT and so on. So whereas odd electron mott insulators, some old organics has shown some quantum oscillations, but I don't think it has been studied in such great depth and there are surprises. Mm -hmm. okay. if, if there are no more questions for Leslie, uh, then let's go on to the theory, uh, the theory section. Thanks. Baskaran, you were gonna say something so I will, and share share a screen. Yeah, Brian told me told me that in there will be maximum time is ten minutes. So I'll take about six minutes and show a couple of slides, okay. run through and speculate, and then we okay. can discuss. Okay. So please allow me to share the screen. So yeah, you should have permission. Screen. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Uh, Great, and uh, let's see. I have to show. So you gotta do this in six minutes. Okay. Yeah. So is it, uh, is, is it all right that I have to yeah. go to the same board? Yeah. Yeah, it looks fine. Yeah. Go for it. Sorry, I will close it and then go to this PDF. But yeah. What's going on. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, you have 12 slides. You're not going to get through 12 slides in, in six minutes, Baskaran. Uh, okay, I will uh, cut them. You know. So this is a question that uh, Brian asked. So I will speculate. I mean, this Mayarana Fermion, actually, it's a very interesting. Suchitra was coming home to Chennai. And uh, she, each time she comes, she tells me exciting results. And she was puzzled about quantum oscillations. Then I remembered the old work by my friend Coleman and company. Then I cooked up a story. Now, yeah, I will just you know, tell about that. So the remarkable possibility is the following. A simple electron Fermi C can be thought of, uh, thought of as four neutral Majorana Fermi C. Because Majorana fermions are normally invoked for spins. Here you have conduction electrons, and there is Majorana C. So what I did in my work was that if you do a simple de hausmann alfen effect calculation, the neutral Majorana fermion contributes equally. It's amazing that. So there is a simple physics behind it. I will come to it. Uh, and in samarium hexaborate, according to theory, three Majorana Fermi C gets gapped and one remains gapless. So the question to experimental and theory colleagues is, can we access selectively one of the four constituent Majorana Fermi C's in a metal like copper or isolate and play with them? Because 
a single electron is very different from a fermi c because once you have fermi c you have tomonaga bosons you have you know bosonic collective mode solitons and a variety of things so and the majorana fermi fermions are one such object so is it possible to isolate them even in a non interacting case and play with them and uh, one way is via proximity effect and in fact already there is some signal in like the pre record talk by kin five mark and uh, valentin lieb uh, there seems to be some proximity either from um, wt2 to graphite or backwards so it's very important if the esoteric mechanism that we are suggesting that there is some kind of failed superconductivity which is uh, doing this then it should show up in proximity effect so time is right to perform some careful uh, proximity experiments this is one statement then um, uh, very interesting contrasting you know, there was a discussion yesterday by vesna mitrovich about nmr relaxation and in her phd students the phd thesis there is beautiful coringa like relaxation and uh, if there are no you know that means there are meta excitations and there is linear specific heat and so on so in contrast if you look at neutron scattering there is a good spin gap so how do you are they compatible i think it can be made compatible within the theory if there are questions i can ask, answer it later and what is very exciting is while physical excitations of majorana fermions are complex fermions there are so called majorana zero modes and uh, there are indications already in kitayev model and in when i do primary analysis in this problem that around kondo hole and vacancies on surfaces and so on you can have majorana zero modes and uh, people have been searching for majorana fermions in the field through you know stm and so on so it's good to look for signals for majorana zero modes zero bias conductance etc maybe condo insulator will provide a platform for topological quantum computation then another fascinating possibility is semi classical trajectory trajectories of majorana fermions in uniform magnetic field because majorana fermion is a coherent superposition of charge minus e electron and charge hole charge plus e hole and like an exciton which is a bound state so lorentz folds according to my theory will take them in opposite direction and add to orbital moment so here is a possibility that you have no metallic screening so can we inject some majorana pulses and then see their uh, trajectories and then see this entanglement physics and rich physics this is one possibility uh, now there is also a very early work by peers and uh, nathan andre uh, about condo stabilized spin liquid in fact when i was look, listening to colin brahms uh, talk what you call a spin one exciton looks like a beautiful uh, spin one excitation of a yeah, gap spin liquid so it's worth exploring because after all finally an arcaic wave interaction in the simple condo lattice model gives up and uh, long range order goes away and we have a spin liquid made up of localized spins and conduction electrons so maybe there is a physics of spin liquid that you know okay so uh, when i gave this talk in 2015 it was uh, gil's birthday so i said that may you have an enjoyable voyage in majorana fermi c in the years to come happy birthday gil so today i wish happy voyage in majorana fermi c to all this at the meeting thank you okay thanks i hope we don't drown but i i think there's um i think there i uh you raise a number of issues uh that could lead to crafting really elegant experiments And I think we've seen a lot of, of elegant experiments already, but there seems to be plenty of scope for uh, even more. Um, Piers, do you have anything to uh, add to what we should be doing? I, I I made a list of a number of questions. I wonder whether okay. I could share my screen. Sure. And, uh, yeah. Uh, let me just. So get I will my... answer. I will answer. Sorry. Answer. I have one slide but okay with thousands of animations. <laughs> <laughs> um so so oh, um uh, I think the one thing I wanted to mention before we can you see that? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I think this field is is a credit to the heroism of the experimentalists um and uh I wanted to encourage them to continue thinking about uh inventive and creative experiments 
uh, but also this issue of reproducibility and the real importance. I, I've had so many discussions with uh, experimenters over the years. They just don't want to do it, but it's really important to have this culture of sample exchange. Please, let's try and help the field by doing more of this. There were issues of bulk versus surface impurity gadolinium effects. These are, it's, it, uh, it's admirable how much work has gone into trying to iron these things out. Um, I would say, uh, as theorists, we have to make a cut in what we decide is important. And uh, uh, one of the issues that we have to ask ourselves is whether, for example, uh, impurity effects such as gadolinium can be squared with oscillations with large Landau orbits and the robust insulating features versus percolation. And I personally don't think they can be. Um, uh, let me remind you of all these anomalous properties that samarium hexaboride has from the linear specific heat that we've known about for 20, 30 years. Uh, we've discovered it's an optical conductor, but a robust B DC bulk insulator. It has this unusual linear thermal conductivity that's induced by field. Uh, and most dramatically, it seems to exhibit this quant these quantum oscillations with lifshitz kosevich behavior down to low temperatures. Um, and so this has thrilled the theoretical field. Uh, uh, and one of the big debates that we're still trying to decide on, and you've seen that at this meeting, is whether this is, these, are, these are insulators or topological insulators with features, uh, or whether we're dealing with the possibility of competing phases with novel excitations. And so hysteresis, field tuning, phase transitions, these are the sorts of things you might imagine the second picture. Uh, 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 um, um, so the, the other issue, the real issue that, 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 that is making this such a fascinating, fascinating field is the issue about the quasiparticles because the conundrum that we're facing is that apparently, and can we be sure the bulk is anomalous. It's electrically insulating, but hosts gapless quasiparticles. And one of the things we need to know, but it seems to be, they don't seem to conduct, and yet they exhibit Landau quantization to very low temperatures, okay? Uh, they don't couple to E, yet couple to B. Is that what's going on here? Um, and so one of the points I wanted to make was that Landau on Sargos to Hass van Alphen's theory is a semi-classical theory. It's a property of wave packets that really go in quantized orbits. And it's very difficult to get far from that whilst preserving all of the observed properties that are seen experimentally. And it does really suggest that we've got a Fermi surface which is being sampled at regular cyclotron frequency energies. Uh, so how could we promote cyclotron resonance without electric fields? Norm normally cyclotron resonance involves the electromagnetic coupling to the quasiparticles, but here, if we can only couple them electromagnetically, uh, uh, how could we do this? Um, uh, and, um, okay, uh, I've got, I'll come back to that remark that's back there. And, and, and so um, my last point, if it's gonna come up, and it doesn't seem to want to, it's gone. Okay, well, I'll just mention it. Uh, um, my last point was, uh, this is a very exciting area, and is there a possible connection between strange insulators and strange metals? Um, uh, strange metals, there's the great debate over whether they're quantum critical systems or whether they're phases. But one of the things I wanted to remind you about in the case of strange metals is that they have a T linear resistivity, but a T squared Hall angle. Uh, they violate Kohler's rule very strongly. And so it's as if there are two different responses to electric and magnetic fields in these systems. Could there be a relationship between this differential response to electric and magnetic fields in strange metals and the severe differential response to electric and magnetic fields in these systems? Thanks very much. Great, thanks. Thanks, Piers. Um, any, are there any questions for Piers? No question. Please try to post questions. Okay, well, I assume you're, this is a panel, so you're still on the panel. Okay. And, uh, it, Sorry, uh, I did have a question. Oh, I just sure. didn't get to that. I was wondering what signatures would be to try and um, uh, establish similarities or differences with the strange metal that Piers mentioned in his last uh, 
suggestion? How could we experimentally try to look for analogies? Well, I, I guess it might be an issue of time scales. Uh, in, in the strange metals, it looks like there may be excitations with two different relaxation time scales. In the case of, of the of the uh, condo insulators, uh, it looks like one component loses its current very, very quickly. It's gapped, it's a good insulator, but another part is very slow in its response. So I think more, uh, uh, more, more probes of magneto-optic properties would be very useful. Uh, someone mentioned microwave probing of samarium hexaboroid. That would really be useful because we're not really at low enough temperatures to go down there. And, and I'd like to know what its dielectric constant is. Can we actually measure it? Um, it seems to be in excess of 500. How big is it? Um, the dielectric constant is, is there a dielectric constant uh, or is it all very soft? I, th these are things that you might establish from really low frequency optical measurements in, in the microwave. So may I uh, ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Jim I, yeah, for, for the exotic um, insulator ideas, as opposed to the ones that involve kind of clever explanations where there still is a gap, but for the exotic Fermi surface pictures, are they also compatible with, with, with the topological insulator ideas? That is, could you make a model where you have an exotic Fermi surface and yeah, it's still an insulator and you predict uh, uh, surface modes that are compatible with topology for which there is also a lot of evidence in SMB6. Yeah, Jim, that you raise a really important issue and, and, and I can't speak for everyone, but I don't see how that's possible. Um, I, I, th I think that you're going to have to consider the possibility like we have, for example, in uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2, where it took a long time to disentangle the local moment antiferromagnetic phase from the hidden order phase. They're very close, they mix together, and only a very tiny field drives you from one to the other. Um, and so you get, you, you actually get poisoning of the hidden order phase by the, by the antiferromagnet. And it took a huge amount of time to separate the two. So here, just imagine, that the topological insulator it is very close in energy to a competing phase that loves to form as you approach the uh, the uh, MOT transition between metal and insulator, or in this case, insulator and metal. Um, uh, in that case, it would be very, especially if field was an important player in this, it might be very difficult to separate the two. You might have hysteretic behavior. You might end up with a sample that stays in one phase for a while and then jumps into the other or has patches of one or the other. And so, and so I think if, if there is an exotic phase there, then it will, it, given that we see surface states, it's very unlikely that it has all the properties of a condo in, topological condo insulator plus a Fermi surface. I, I don't think that's, that's possible. I think if you're, if you're gonna say it's, a topological condo insulator, then you've got to look for the first scenario where, where you're looking for additional features of a topological condo insulator that give the physics. Um, uh, but if you're going to go for exotic excitations, I think you're going to be forced to admit there has to be a phase boundary, a two-phase coexistence. And so we could look for that two-phase coexistence if it were there. So could we infer then that if, they, if one of Suchitra's samples is is reliably producing the exotic bulk Fermi surface that it would not at the same time uh, reliably produce the, the plateau in the resistivity, which we imagine is the uh, result of the surface states. I, is that I think a fair that's, line of reasoning? I think it's a fair line of reasoning, but beware of first order phase transitions and coexistence, right? Well, that's, that's why that's, I inserted, that's why I inserted yeah. the word reliably produces the exotic Fermi surface with the implication that every time I stick it in the Hassan Alpha machine, I get the result I get, implying yeah. that it's stuck in that phase. Yeah, possibly field induced into that phase. Uh, we've, never, we've never had to deal with experimentally with the possibility of two coexisting insulating phases. It's, okay. Okay. it's, it's hard to separate those apart from one another. Um, and, and so that, that's my concern. Uh, I, 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 
I, I, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't want, I, maybe Central can uh, can jump in on this, and maybe he thinks it is possible to reconcile uh, yeah. uh, surface state with it. But I, I personally don't think so. Um, yeah. So I, you know, so to address the specific question that was asked, whether as a matter of principle, it's possible for some state of matter to both have uh, weird excitations in the bulk, say like neutral fermions, homeofermic surface or something, while at the same time be a topological insulator uh, with, uh, with uh, surface conducting states? The answer is yes, you can certainly make models of that sort. So just seeing in uh, you know, uh, one of these uh, samples, uh, you know, in the ideal world where there's definitive proof of surface conducting states, and this uh, very convincing evidence for a bulk neutral form of surface, there's no contradiction between those two as a matter of principle. And whether any of these things are happening in any of the samples people are currently studying is a separate question. But I think you were asking a question about a matter of principle. But, but central principles have to be backed up by, uh, by actions, which means that if you think it could be done as a matter of principle, you should write down such a theory. Sure, give me a week. <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> no, the theory has been written down, but it's all... Uh, I, no, 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 your theory has, has been written down, but you haven't at least explained pedagogically how it has surface states. Okay, very good. That, that, that's a good point, right? Yes. But, but, it, but it seems like what, what a, a different way of rephrasing what some of you are saying is that uh, not only should samples be shared, but on specific samples, different measurements on, on, a, on a single sample, different measurements should be taken and, and under different circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a comment yeah. to uh, Jim, Jim Allen that I think interactions will not only preserve these possible exotic states in the bulk, it's likely to make surface topological states even more exotic. So it's good to keep that in mind because interactions can do wonder. You know, it's not that it's going to spoil the bulk phenomena. It may make surface more interesting also. In particular, Majorana modes on the surface. I had thought a little bit about it, but this is not the time to talk about it. Thank you. So Nigel is on the panel also. Nigel, do you have any, any comments? Um, yeah, well, I, um, I was going to say a couple of words about the sort of the non-exotic uh, aspect of, you know, okay. how we can you know, rule in or rule out uh, the existence of just Landau quantization of an insulator or a band insulator. And, and the th I mean, that, that we know, of course, in principle that can happen, uh, but the, the, the point, the, the qualitative difference between that and some other gapless Fermi surface is all in the Dingle factor. The fact that, you know, in a, for a gapless model, the, um, you know, we, should, we should see a Dingle factor that's limited only by by disorder, whereas for something which is uh, insulating, there should be some intrinsic dingle damping, you know, the, the suppression of E to the minus uh, B zero over B as B goes to zero. And, and I would encourage the experimentalists where possible to, to really try and characterize the oscillations. What is B zero and how does it depend on quality? Of course, you're limited in what quality you can, you can look at, but you can try and do some extrapolation and see is this for the cleanest samples? Is it tending to something which is non-zero, meaning that there could be some gap, maybe an almostly small, or you know, maybe maybe the origin of that could be exotic in itself. You know, it's not. I'm not here. I'm not going to say that everything can be understood in terms of some very trivial non-interacting electrons. But but I think characterizing whether there's a gap at all. Uh, or not, and understanding the properties of that Dingle factor are central to understanding the qualitative origin of the oscillations. And, if, and indeed, it's quite, you know, it's reasonable and plausible that different, you know, oscillations in, say, in Samaritan hoxaboride, they may have different origins. Some of them may be, you know, arising from uh, non-exotic reasons, and some may be exotic. So that's, that's one uh, comment that you know, suggestion for something to um, try and quantify as a way to characterize the materials as best as possible. Any questions uh, for Nigel? I'd like to um, I'd like to bring Chandra in uh, and ask um, 
in relation to uh, Chandra, uh, in relation to your recent theory on Sumerian hexafluoride, uh, how do you explain, um, or how do you think of tungsten telluride, for instance, or, or because this, your, your ideas for Sumerian hex hexafluoride rely on mixed balance pretty, pretty strongly. You can tell me if that's a stupid question also. Well, uh, I, I, I've been thinking a bit about uh, tungsten ditelluride, but I would uh, I would like to wait to be completely sure uh, that uh, the experimental issues are uh, okay are, are absent. I would like, however, to go back to the question with which you uh, opened this panel to the theorists as to what are are there any specific predictions that one can make to test the theory and. Uh, I had uh, three predictions. Uh, one of them is fairly trivial that there should be magneto oscillations in the specific heat. And um, uh, your group seems to have seen them. And I, I gather from uh, your student, Mr. Fortune, uh, I, I, I presume his first name is good. No, no, uh, no, Nat, Nat, Nat Fortune is not my student. I just, I need to, I need to interject it. <laughs> okay, but his yeah. name is Fortune. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. We're very fortunate to have him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that the oscillations have the same frequency as what uh, Suchitra sees, the pro most prominent, and also his background specific heat, uh, five millijoules, is similar to Suchitra. But I have the other, and this is the uh, two most um, uh, uh, remarkable predictions are one that uh, the excitations are not merely chargeless, they're also spinless. And therefore that in magneto oscillations, there should be uh, in the appropriate experiment evidence that there isn't spin. And um, I gather from the talk downloaded by Dr. Singleton, that in the insulating state of uh, samedi of iterbium boron 12, there is uh, no spin splitting. He has done the right experiment. And if you increase the uh, magnetic field so that it becomes metallic, then the spin splitting uh, arises. I think that's very significant. And I think one should look for, uh, my, uh, from what I vaguely remember, to see spin splittings is even easier in specific heat oscillations. So that should be done. The third prediction is that you cannot have at least my kind of Maharanas uh, without having in the regime in which there is evidence for other Maharanas in the experiment, you cannot have them without a large absent entropy. And that can be uh, uh, seen and, and if you look at the data, there are peculiarities, but this this issue is not uh, settled. Uh, however, there are peculiarities in both samarium hexaboride and in iterbium boron 12 about the uh, total total entropy. Great. Uh, so these are the very specific predictions, and may I make one more remark? Mm -hmm. uh, which is the kind of Majorana that I'm talking about is a fact for a single mixed valence impurity. Okay, it's an, so it, it arises in the exact solution mm -hmm. of a single mixed valence impurity. What I have done uh, for the lattice is an approximate theory, okay? Uh, with some reasons why the approximation may be, may be all right. Uh, but, but I expect the theory to be breaking down at some extreme low temperature, okay, uh, where independent Maharanas may not be allowed to exist. Thank you. Any comments on uh, on those uh, predictions, or any or any of the other, Patrick? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a question um, to 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 the Marana folks, uh, uh, Askaran and uh, Piers and, and Chandra. Uh, what 
what is the prediction for optical conductivity, low frequency? I, mean, I, I was the one who raised the possibility of microwave. Um, is it power law or is it gap? I mean, when I looked at that data that was quick, rapidly uh, showing uh, the terahertz, it seems to go down to fairly low uh, uh, frequency and it, uh, there's no gap there. Uh, there's, clear, there's clearly no gap there. So, so it looks like maybe optically- um, No gap. There's no gap, yeah. So uh, what are we talking about neutral objects then? Uh, Patrick, let me address, address, try and address that question. Um, in fact, there is a remark about this in our paper on Skirm insulators in, from three years ago. And the important, important point to realize is that strictly speaking, when you form a Majorana Fermin, it's not an eigenstate of zero charge. It's a state uh, of uncertain charge. It's a state where E squared is finite, but E is zero um, on average. Um, and so what you find is that the matrix elements for spin and charge grow linearly with energy. Uh, and so what this then means is that if you look at the current current response function, it picks up an additional omega squared on top of what you might expect, yeah. I think. So yeah. I think that's what you'd expect in such a simple minded so picture. Omega square, yeah. Actually, that brings up my, my other question is that uh, if, if Maran is a charge neutral, no, usually we, we think we need a superconductor. Right to to mix particle and hole, and you break um, gauge invariance. This is how you avoid uh, you know, coupling to electric field being the same in the same way as magnetic field. So, do you need uh, some kind of superconducting at least fluctuation or pairing in this kind of scenario? Well, uh, in the, uh, I think so. I think, as you know, that uh, par particles couple to vector potential, and. Uh, and it's impossible to get a differential coupling to electric and magnetic fields if you preserve gauge invariance, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, so, mm. and so you need something that breaks gauge invariance. And so you need on short distances, something that resembles uh, uh, a superconductor. And so the Skirm insulator is an attempt to address that question uh, in terms of something that has the Meister stiffness, but not the topological stiffness. Okay. So you so can't create vortices that are stable. Uh, uh, and, and so as a result, the magnetic field can penetrate the system, as can the electric field. Yeah, so, so you would have to say that Samaria has a boride is actually a failed, uh, failed superconductor. We would. We'd have. So is there <laughs> evidence? Can you do experiment to measure that? Well, uh, uh, the one, ex one prediction we made has failed. Um, uh, we expected that if you went to very low fields, the flux would expel. And uh, <laughs> Samarium hexaboride at the Tata Institute has been taken down to incredibly low fields. It might be, it might be as low as a nano Tesla, but I'm not sure. Um, and there's no sign of any uh, change in the susceptibility, no sign of diamagnetism. So but this- Down this, to what temperature? Uh, actually, I, I, I believe probably down to about one Kelvin. Actually, probably Suchitra knows more about this than I do. Unfortunately, um. uh, they haven't published their results, and it's a real, real pity. Oh. That. What is the correlation? Um, I, I think it's much lower temperatures. Um, it's yeah. yeah, it's milli Kelvin, very okay. low milli Kelvin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, think I should say that I I have uh, no no reason to invoke any superconductivity in the Majoranas that I'm talking about. Okay, Lou Lee has a question. He's raising his yes, hand. Yes, I have a general comment and a general question. The comment about the spin splitting. Um, so um, a convenient way to explain there's no splitting at all is just assume G factor is zero. Wherever there's spin zero, well, there might be just a way to hand me argue that not there. What I would like to comment, like <coughs> uh, uh, Professor Varman pointed out, this is happening <coughs> in insulator state. And what we see, angles we observe, quantum oscillations in both resistivity and the has often effects. We do not observe the spring splitting in all the angles. So um, if we want to argue that certain kinds of spin zero effects uh, or any other thing, we need to consider this geometry. That's, that's my comment. My general question came back through the chest that Patrick raised first, many others followed, was about what I, I 
call I think, there's, is the some, I think there's some sound issue right you, and, and, you. And, and Lou you're breaking up yeah you're, now, you're, give me a hands out of them your sound is breaking can you up. hear me now yes can you I'm sorry can you hear me now can yes. you hear me I think it's on your end because I don't see any problem with uh, with the other folks and your uh, your screen. Can we come back to you maybe? Lou, turn off your camera and just use audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Greg. All right, okay. All right. All right, okay. I'll, I'll come back to the question later. Um, um, so my question was simply- Turn off your- can you turn off your camera? Oh yeah, good idea. Thank you. All right. Can you guys hear me? Give me yes. some answer. Yes. All right, good. So my, my simple question is about insulator, right? For all the three compounds we have been talking about in these two days and a low temperature, there will be a plateau of resistance. How big, how, how small is a different question. But having a plateau, would that exclude a definitional insulator? That's my question. Okay, that's a good question. Anybody want to pipe in? The question was, ha having seen a plateau, does that exclude that as an insulator? I think that was the question. Okay. Yeah. I, maybe we. I, I think uh, make sense back. I, mean, I, I think that depends on the origin of the plateau. I mean, in yeah, the case yeah. of tungsten dipelorite. That plateau, you know, happens at 100 uh, mega ohms, and you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> this, this is by your measurement uh, uh, method. So, uh, yeah. So, and I think in that case, it's it, it's likely a true insulator. But uh, the plateau I was I was uh, I was uh, uh, mentioning has to do with the data on the bulk uh, tandem uh, tungsten dipelorite that uh, that actually Sang Feng showed, and there there was a plateau, and that plateau was not that high. So I think bulk tantalum dipelorite uh, is, uh, I would say, is a metal, even though the resistivity is high, uh, because it's, uh, you know, it's 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 uh, three other magnitude bigger in, in magnetic field, but it starts out with very very low resistivity. It's a amazingly good metal. So even after three or four many, um, other magnitude increases, still, you know, it's it's decent. Uh, it's not it's not mega ohms. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think in that case, I think there's a reasonable understanding of, of that metal, uh, you know, as a perfectly compensated electron and hole that, that has an unsaturated uh, H, H square. So then maybe there's no mystery there. I don't know. Uh, is Juan on around? He, if Juan is around, he can tell us. But, uh, you know, that's something that they thought about when they wrote that paper. Are there any? Yeah. <laughs> Comments? Any more comments? Any? Anyone? Maybe I should say, um, okay. in response to some of these discussions uh, I made. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, so there was something, uh, uh, you know, so of the three materials that are being discussed, the, uh, uh, you know, tungsten dichloride is microscopically so different from the mixed balance systems so that it's good to separate the discussion on the origins of whatever is observed, right? And not assume that it's the same thing that's going on. Micros uh, clearly, microscopically, they're so different that uh, the starting point has to be different, right? Uh, so those, uh, uh, you know, um, part of the discussion, that the discussion in the mixed balance systems uh, has to involve, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it has to seriously involve this uh, thing that Luli mentioned in his talk uh, at the very quickly at the very end, that there is a measurement, uh, a reported measurement of thermal conductivity in deuterium boron 12, which looks metallic at low fields. Uh, uh, and seems like it's a good thermal conductor, though it's an electrical insulator. Uh, it would be great for people to reproduce that result. Uh, if correct, I think that that's really important information that cannot be ignored in any discussion of what's going on in that system. Right? And, uh, you know, um, in principle, uh, sort of in, uh, going along the lines of what Pierce was saying, if this 
something in the system responds to a magnetic field by forming Lando orbits and so on, it should show up in things like thermal Hall effect, which uh, uh, I believe was also measured at low fields in uh, ytterbium boron 12, but people should measure it in high fields if possible. Uh, but I mainly want to make a theoretical comment on this discussion of neutral fermions uh, that has been going on. Uh, you know, as Patrick uh, uh, was asking a few minutes back, uh, uh, there's one kind of neutral firm, uh, you know, this, this Mirana fermion story, which uh, naively requires a superconductor, right? And uh, at least in the naivest in incarnations, requires a superconductor. And uh, I think uh, if something is not a superconductor, then you have to there's tension with postulating a Mayana Fermi, right? Now uh, we know that it's possible to get emergent Mayana fermions in an insulator, right? Uh, you know, uh, there's the famous Kitayev honeycomb model where that happens. Now, uh, at least in deuterium boron 12 and samarium hexaboride, there's no doubt that these are three-dimensional cubic materials, right? Uh, they're not poly 2D systems, uh, they are, they are three-dimensional materials. Now there's a very general result uh, that uh, if you want emergent Mayana fermions in an insulator in three dimensions, that must be accompanied by a finite temperature of phase transition, right? And uh, you know, to date, there is no evidence of any finite temperature of phase transition in either samarium hexaboride or in ytterbium boron 12. So I think, uh, those are zero order facts about postulating Mayana fermions, which one should worry about before worrying about more exotic experiments. Uh, question, Sankal, yeah. is your uh, remark about uh, transition in three dimension confined to uh, Kitab type models? No, it's a bit. Uh, it, it's a very general statement. How would the transition be observed? In how, heat capacity. How how, 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 how many how, how large an entropy would I mean what's the degree of freedom that I mean what type of transition are we talking about? Yeah, so you need the emergence of some uh, that it's a transition without an order parameter. You know, having a man of Fermi on emergent and ins insulator is a really exotic thing, right? So it, Clearly, there's something topological that's going on. That so it's a topological phase moving. transition. It's a topological right. phase transition. So there might not be a, an anomaly. In, in the simplest example, it would be an icing phase transition. Right? But it could be more complicated than that. But there has to be a phase transition. But, and, you know, quantum oscillations and things like Samaria mix of are seen below 15 Kelvin or so. Mm -hmm. right? So you need a, you know, you can't push the phase transition temperature down to a nano Kelvin. Right? It's got to be there in the regime in which you're trying to explain the observed phenomena. I just want to make a comment to Sintil's remarks. Um, I mean, Piers pointed out it's like a failed superconductors. And one way to think about it is normally you have a gap in a superconductor or at best a node, node like in D wave superconductor. Here, at least in the simple theory, you have a complete Bogoli above Fermi surface. So in that sense, it's a dissipative superconductor. So any possible order will be very subtle, maybe easily mistake, um, uh, escape. So this is a very unusual superconductor, which has not just line nodes, but surface nodes within this theory. So that should be kept in mind. So that's a possibility. It's a very dissipative superconductor, very highly resistive. So one should look for some local signatures of pair fluctuations and superconductivity experimentally. Thank you. Any ideas on how to do that or any other questions? Well, if you can tunnel, if you can do tunneling that you can throw it. But I guess no one has succeeded in tunneling into SMB. SMB, yeah. Exactly, tunneling experiments have not been done seriously. In Oh, sorry, so it seems like the real question is whether Samarium exaborate or Ytterbium boron 12 in the bulk is an insulator or, a, or 
you know, is it a good insulator? I thought it was supposed to be a good insulator in the book, right? Uh, yes. You know, it seems like we've gone from that discussing whether it's a good insulator in the bulk to saying, look, maybe it's a superconductor. I mean, shouldn't experimentalists be able to decide? I think only theorists are saying that it's a superconductor. No, I'm saying it's not a superconductor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I would want to go back and, you know, I think it's, uh, I think optical conductivity is, is very key because, you know, it, it doesn't look like a good uh, insulator to me so far. Um, so it will be a kind of exotic insulator with a power law, right? But I thought the surface states make it look not, not so insulating. I thought it was, if you take away the surface states and yeah, yeah. But it looks I like a very optical conductivity. Is There's a couple of comments in the chat from Jennifer <clears throat> about okay. thermal conductivity. Maybe we should um, uh, ask her. Yeah, I haven't been looking at that. So Jennifer Reed. Jennifer Reed says, uh, as thermal conductivity is consistent with bulk insulating behavior. Maybe Jennifer should ask the question. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. I guess I, I'm not sure what the question is, but I'm just wondering, uh, well, yeah, where the debate is on whether or not it's an insulator, because the thermal conductivity, um, I mean, I, I'm in Rob Hill's group and, and we measured Suchitra samples, um, but other groups found this as well, uh, that there's group, that there, the, um, the, I mean, because the resistance is very high, the V difference law, it, 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 the electrons contribute almost no, nothing to the thermal conductivity. Um, so we have no, we don't see a, a linear component to cap over P versus P squared. Um, so uh, the thermal conductivity tends to go to zero as per, like at, consistent with just phonons um, in zero field. And then when you look at the high temperature behavior, um, I mean, you see a peak thermal conductivity. Um, so it, it's just completely consistent with uh, a, a bulk insulator. Have you, ha, has, have there been me several measurements? I mean, I mean, this might be a stupid question, but have the, is the sort of irreproducibility in thermal conductivity that there is in the specific heat? Do you know? Um, Typhaeus group also found uh, this kind of insulating behavior on different samples. But is the magnitude qualitatively the same or? Um, there seems to be some sample dependence, um, which hopefully our, our paper will help to, our results will help to dissuade. But um, when you don't have the pure, pure enough samples, then it's hard to determine whether or not an increase in thermal conductivity with, um, yeah. with magnetic field is due to decrease in magnetic scattering or if it's due to additional excitations. So have you also measured the turbium boron 12? Um, yeah, actually, uh, we have measured a couple of samples, um, and we're measuring um, some higher quality samples right now. So, so do you reproduce the cells from Matsuda and Luli? Or? Um, we, that's still to be determined. Okay. Not yet. Okay. So, um, so can I comment also on the thermal connectivity? Yes, please. Um, so this is going back a couple of years, but uh, so in the paper we did with the uh, Typhair group, because we provided samples as well, and there was floating zone and flux grown crystals measured together. Uh, the, yeah, basically, you know, there was some debate earlier about whether there was some finite residual T linear thermal conductivity or not. We didn't find any. So at T equals zero, there was no T linear term. And then there's a slope as you increase temperature, which was consistent with phonons. And then uh, the anomalous thing was that when you apply magnetic field, the slope increases. Um, so there was a debate back then whether this increase was exceeding the so-called boundary scattering limit, which would mean you have some additional excitations, or whether the, the magnetic field was suppressing some scattering of the phonon conduction. And basically letting you reach this boundary scattering limit. So in our work, we concluded that we were uh, not at the boundary scattering limit and that as you applied magnetic field, you could get to that maximum phonon conduction, that there was no uh, excess carriers from some other exotic mechanism. And additionally, we showed that you could take the same sample and change the dimensions and show that this boundary scattering limit changed as you would expect. 
So I don't know if there, there's a new development from uh, Rob Hill's group, which would be consistent with that or not. Is that, did I read that correctly, that that's true? You asking Jennifer? Yes, I'm asking Jennifer, sorry. Oh, sorry, could you repeat um, the direct question? I was just looking at the chat. Marie um, posted type errors. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the, the statement we made was that you could apply magnetic field and see an increase in thermal conductivity, but it would essentially saturate at the boundary scattering limit, which meant that magnetic field was reducing some kind of scattering mechanism of the phonon conduction, and that there were no other, at least no sizable contribution of some other type of exotic carrier. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, no, we, uh, we see boundary limited, um, phone on scattering in zero fields. And we confirmed that by um, reducing this, the cross-sectional area of uh, one of those high quality flow and zone grown samples um, to check the sample scaling as you were asking about yesterday. Um, and we do see the very strong sample scaling, uh, scaling with sample size, which is consistent with boundary limited phone on behavior. Um, so that it means that the increase that we see in magnetic field is above the, the phone on boundary scattering limit. Okay, so that is still a, a, a difference in conclusions from the two groups. Yes, and, but both of our groups do see insulating behavior. Okay, Can I ask that's a, a question? That's a key difference because if there is excess carriers and they're exotic, then that is a key observation. And this can be resolved by simple experiments. So I, I, Has the specific heat and the thermal conductivity been measured on the same sample? Because if you're in the Casimir limit with thermal conductivity, you should be able to say something about the mean free path of whatever is, right? I mean, that's um, a simple, simple. Uh, I have to check. Yes. Heat capacity yes. has been measured on the samples that Jennifer is measuring thermal conductivity on. Great. So that would be interesting to, to see what the, what the ratio of those two. Uh, let me step in here, sorry, as an organizer, and suggest yeah. that we take maybe one more question from Mohit, then we draw this to an official close, and I'll stop Great. the recording, and then maybe the discussion can go a little bit longer in an unofficial capacity. Who's asking the question? Uh, Mohit, Mohit Renderia. Okay. Hi, so my question is to Nigel, but also to others. So what are the things that we do not understand in terms of the non-exotic models? And let me actually elaborate on that question because there are some important papers that have just simply not been mentioned. For instance, uh, uh, Liang Fu's work, which introduces impurity induced states in models similar to Nigel's and Pavang's, and Brian Skinner's work, which also talks about how to understand some aspects, though not the quantum oscillation uh, due to impurity states. So could you please comment on that? So, so indeed, I, I think that the, um, uh, I mean, for, from my perspective, the, the things that are missing from the non-exotic um, uh, um, description are uh, a consistent understanding of the low temperature entropy and heat capacity and um, uh, the, uh, and also a, a quantitative you know, a quantitative theory that matches the um, Dingle factor that is seen in the experiment. So, so I think putting, you know, I, I think that there's scope to, I, I, I don't think it's been done, but I think there's scope to put together um, a, a model that would perhaps use impurities or other low, um, uh, low energy excitations uh, together with some, um, Influence of lambda quantization of the uh, of the um, of the insulating bands to to try and um, uh, match experiment, but I but doing that in a quantitative way, uh, I think is is uh, is missing. Others, I'm sure, will have different views, but that's um, that's my feeling. Yeah. It Good to hear from others too, because before going to super exotic mechanism, we have to understand what are the problems with the non-exotic mechanisms and are they just quantitative or are they qualitative? Yeah. May I make a comment? Uh, yeah. Uh, Mohit, 
the puzzle is, for example, this linear specific heat. Even in the best sample, you know, it survives. And then thermal conductivity, mean free paths. So I don't see how that could be explained in the uh, impurity band within that mechanism. Uh, uh, can example, I make a small but, comment here? Sorry, just as someone yes, who okay. literally considered exactly that question. An impurity band generically does give you a linear and T-specific heat. It's just associated with classical rearrangement of electrons inside the impurity band. Bhaskar, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sorry. Does it do it quantitatively? Well, it's, it's, the, the value of gamma is that of a metal, you know, the dense metal. Can your impurity band give that much gamma? Well, it's hard to say because it depends exactly on the impurity concentration. I made an order of magnitude estimate and it looked about like 10 millijoules per mole Kelvin squared, and which seemed okay because to me. But I don't claim that it's a quantitative agreement. And does, does it remain, a, does it remain an, an insulator or is it a metal? Vaskar, Pierce has a comment? Yeah, I, to, uh, you're beautiful. it's beautiful to have impurity bands. They're, they're present in all known semiconductors, uh, but don't they make them into metals? Uh, only above the critical doping. There's always a critical doping below which know, you're an uh, insulator and above uh, which you're a conductor. And, and, and what, what, would you, what would your estimate be for that in samarium hexaboride, the critical doping? After all, oh, okay. it's less, less than a fraction of a percent in a, in a typical semiconductor. Yeah, I agree. Actually, when I, when I started doing that analysis, the primary problem I had to cope with was why is it so hard to dope this thing into a metallic state? Because uh, we know that in some samples, there are as much as a percent of impurities, and the thing is still looks like an insulator, so what's right. going on? Not just a, not just a, 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 a so-so insulator, an excellent insulator. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, I, I have an explanation for that in the paper that I linked to you, and it comes right. down to the fact that the impurities are not hydrogenic in nature as they are in a normal mm -hmm. uh, insulator, and it comes down to the unusual shape of the, of the conduction band, the hybridized shape of the conduction band that makes the wave function of the impurity state look very different as rapid oscillations that end up sort of canceling each other in the overlap integral. So I, I don't want to go into that and arrest the discussion okay. that way, but I, I have okay. a possible explanation for that. So, so, once again, I would suggest that the, the terbium boron 12 thermal connectivity experiment be scrutinized carefully by other groups, because if it's a thermal metal, then it's not uh, these impurity band insulating states. You know, but there's no question then, right? And given there's a report of metallic thermal connectivity, there's no reason why it should not be scrutinized carefully. Yeah, I can certainly agree with that, that impurity band physics does not give you a, a metallic-like thermal conductivity. Nigel had, it, you, you had your hand up at some point. But... No, it was, it, was, it was a comment about okay. that Brian on the top of the Okay. Any other, any other, any other, um, let's see, who, who was it who, uh, Mohit's question about uh, exhausting, I guess he, he's asking about uh, using Occam's razor on the theories. Right? Can I make a comment on that, uh, Art? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, I, so this is uh, Peter Armitage. And so uh, this was a point we made in our, in our terahertz paper on this where uh, I worked a lot on impurity bands in uh, in silicon, and this was a point we made in this paper was that something strange must be going on in samarium hexaboride because uh, uh, the the optical conductivity was in fact uh, you know it, 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 nothing like I mean it looked it was power law but it was it, the the value was huge it was as large as it was in metallic glasses so you know it's not one part in ten to the fifth, but it was really a huge value. And so the, indeed, the question there was: was if this is impurities, why isn't it just a metal? Why does it look anything like uh, uh, power law conductivity? And uh, yeah, so in the chat, there's been a, there's been a, uh, a rather vigorous discussion on this point. And so I also uh, I'm in favor of the the Occam's razor perspective on this that we need to as much as I would like there to be Majoranas in these systems, I think that we should. Uh, Rule out the possibilities for simple models to uh, to 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 explain a lot of the physics. Thermal conductivity, I think, is super important. Yeah, I, hand, I, hope you, yeah. I hope you don't mind if I step in here as a meta sure. organizer yeah. here and yeah, say yeah, yeah. let's let's officially draw the panel to a close, and okay. anyone who has time commitments can leave. And yeah. I want to thank you all very much for participating. I think this has been a wonderful workshop.
And let me take a moment specifically to call out the support of Anton Akhmarov and the people at the Virtual Science Forum who did a lot of logistic uh, legwork for us. And we're very grateful for their support.